Hey, welcome back to our RegCast today. We're going inside an internal cloud. And uh, so, set phases to stun. Shields up. Red alert. Because we've got the guys back in the house. Yes, it's Kirk and Spock. Well, still in Nesborough. Um, our guys from Royal Mail were uh, so popular last time with you, and you like the uh, you like the fact that they give straight answers to straight questions that you ask. That we got them back, and uh, so welcoming you to the studio again, Adrian. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming back. This one's a bit of a big project, isn't it? See, we were doing desktops last time. Now it's servers. Yep. Don't you, don't you ever get enough of this? Never enough. Yeah. We have to boldly go. <laughs> oh, I can see Star Trek metaphors yeah. coming on. <laughs> and uh, joining him, the man who puts the logic into logical. I don't know where I'm going with that. Glyn, welcome ah. back as well. Thank you. I, I just want to know how I get the geeky nerd piece and he gets the guy, the, the handsome looking guy that gets all the girls. Because you're taller. Okay. It's, 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 it's more of a sort of a... But, you know, and also Adrian's kind of like the sort of... Uh, he is the more attractive he's the, guy that gets like Well, no, he's, the, he's, right. he's the more sort of all-action sort of guy, whereas you're the, you can't do that, it wouldn't work sort of person. Yeah, and actually, have you seen that picture? That's you. <laughs> Separated the birds. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a similarity. I hope it is. Uh, so we, we actually <laughs> should have got you a fancy dress for this, actually. <laughs> that, uh, that would be the one. It's only one set. If you come back a third time. <laughs> or it's Glyn calls it the evening dress. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so as um, if you were here for the, the first time round, so you know, Adrian's the man at uh, Royal Mail who's in charge of the projects. Glyn, um, because the IT is outsourced, Glyn at CSC is uh, in charge of getting the stuff done. And uh, they have an entertaining relationship where Adrian can phone Glyn up and shout at him down the phone. Glyn has to say, yes, we'll do that. That's how it works, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or, or something like that. And, of course, joining them on the, to the RegCast today. Uh, yeah. So, um, that, uh, Dale, you must... Uh, so am I that much shorter than you? That's my question. Well, I, I was just thinking, I'm your straight man, and you put the, you know, <laughs> you put the, the, you know, the, the, the comedy into. So you, you, you remember Cannon and Ball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you remember the, I'm you remember the catchphrase? Go on, go on. Yeah, remember, rock on, Tommy. Oh, uh, rock no, on, go on, do, go on, do it, rock do on, it. Tommy. That's it. <laughs> That's that. That's it. So anyway, to uh, we need to explain the interface to you for um, you know any suggestions about uh, double acts that we might be, or indeed there's four of us. We could have you know we could have been ABBA or the Beatles or something like that. The um, any suggestions, good sensible ones only, of course. Um, but please ask questions today. There's um, the, you know there's a lot of good stuff today because these guys are talking from experience, not from marketing hype. Um, so and they. They, they do know where the bodies are buried on, uh, when it comes to implementing internal cloud. So uh, please do ask those questions. You can download the slides. Not many of them today. It's mostly talk. And uh, you can give us your feedback afterwards. Let us know how we did. And uh, if you're not bored with them yet, who knows? We might even be able to drag them back yet again. It depends whether they managed to sort of like successfully change their email addresses and mobile phone numbers before we <laughs> next get to them. So uh, Now, so we... The reason why we're here, Adrian, is that you st you're taking your servers and you're sticking them in an internal cloud. Why? Um, we've got a couple of thousand Wintel boxes, everything ranging from NT4, all physical, all normal TIN, all traditional operating systems, hardly any virtualization whatsoever. And that was 2008. You know, so virtualization had been around for a while. Raw Mail had done nothing. So we got a watershed moment where we we'd got to do something. We've got to make a major investment either in TIN again do more of the same, or uh, with our partner CSC, actually spend some time actually doing something different. So, good opportunity, look at it, just like we did the email last time, look at it, do a transformation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, virtualization had been out there for a long time, um, and clearly it was right for us to do. But a lot of people have just gone to virtualization, stuck at that, yep. okay, and they've not taken it all the way to this, uh, this internal cloud. What does that extra step get you? It, it gave us a couple of things. Um, well, it gave us a couple of things. Is a clearly we've got the normal virtualization benefits, but the one with CSC was, you know, to a certain extent we don't care. We just want a leveraged pool of resources that we just want to call down on. Uh, you know, I don't care about high CPU boxes, low CPU boxes, the difficulties, the technicalities. We, we just needed. Please take the risk away of all this NT4 and Windows 2000 and all these legacy operating systems and the inherent risk of the tin 
and do something with it. And it was CSC that came up with, uh, well, actually, well, we'll deliver you a, a, a kind of private cloud. And I know it's an emotive term, and everybody views things differently. With tools, we just see it as a big, I suppose you can view it as a, as, as a mainframe. It's kind of a Wintel version of a mainframe we view it as. Yeah, Glenn, you, you actually volunteered this then. It was, this was your idea. I would say jointly. <laughs> Our idea, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, but, I mean, at this time, what, what date are we talking about? What date? Oh, crikey. Well, and I, don't mean, I don't mean the actual date. Yeah, the I'm physical day and yeah. date. We're talking about 18 months ago. 18 maybe, months maybe ago. Maybe slightly more, yeah. yeah. 18 oh, this time, you know, ago. you're right on the bleeding edge, so you're picking sort of quite a large and important yeah. customer to volunteer this for. Yeah. So I'd have to question whether you are the appropriate man to be doing your job Sanity. in this case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I seem case. to remember the same question last time as well. Yeah. Genius or, or oh, I mean, it just comes to me whenever I talk about these things <laughs> that you do with them. But there's, you know, uh, you know and, and that's it. So why did you think that this would be, you know, a good, a good customer a good to sort of test this out on? Well, it's uh, partly it's uh, the main part is around the relationship we have with people like the Royal Mail. So if we don't continually evolve our business and the way we go to market and the services we provide. Then, then we don't exist in, in X amount of years. And people like the Royal Mail who are consciously wanting to work with partners who, who do drive leading edge transformations in a business that, that maybe people out in the marketplace don't see as a leading edge transformational business in the, in the Royal Mail. So it, it kind of was a, a perfect storm at that point to say, well, let, let's do something different. We've got a good enough relationship to get through the roller coaster ride. And, it, and it's not a case of it's simple and let's just turn up and switch a credit card on it and off we go. There is a roller coaster ride to be had here, so why not do it in a in a perfect partnership rather than test it out with somebody brand new totally? And, and it's not dissimilar to the to the BPOS piece that we did around. Yes, there's a contract, but you, you put that to one side because both parties are aiming for the for the same goal at the end of the day. Yeah, it's a day. One of the problems with this is that there's not a really a common understanding of exactly what the internal cloud cloud technologies in general mean is that it's very much in flux no there, there's a lot of confusion and i think people kind of um well the, the two the two things that we we pick up from all the messaging and uh stuff we hear from marketing people and analysts and stuff is uh one school of thought is you've done your virtualization you've consolidated your servers the next step is private cloud uh which is quite an interesting one because um uh, as Adrian was saying earlier on, it, it's about private cloud is about creating a pool of resource which you use in a, a very flexible way. When people go through server consolidation, they still end up with actually quite a fixed infrastructure. It's just that now they've got more things. They, they've got they, they, condensed, they've scrunched they've got condensed tighter, yeah. fixed infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you could argue there's, there's more flexibility because you can move virtual machines around and stuff like that. But that's not quite the same as an environment where you, you've got a, a lot of automation or semi-automation to... Um, to move things around and have that kind of flexibility. So um, th there's, there's a big question uh, there. I think the other thing is people just mix up private cloud with public cloud, and um, it all just ends up as this cloudy, confusing, and no one knows what the hell people are talking about quite often. Mm. So, And it, it's quite important. A lot of the objections that people have to cloud are associated with uh, public cloud or hosted services of one kind or another. Mm. And actually, a lot of those aren't particularly relevant to internal infrastructure. So that's probably something we'll pick up as, as we yeah. go through. But. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that is an important point, because we were at, uh, actually, you know, both, you know, both Adrian and me were at this cloud exhibition yeah. thing last week. And uh, to say that people were um, people that were visiting that was, were uncommitted is is, uh, is an understatement. I was expecting in uh, you know in the sessions that we were at, I was expecting when I said who's implementing cloud technologies now, I was thinking Forrester Hands because you turned up to an exhibition about it after all, and it's the one or two hands who's yeah who's not who's not doing it now, a lot more hands you know so mm -hmm. it was. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. People are thinking about it, but are uh, very thinking, not doing. Well, what, what's interesting, what, what we're seeing in the marketplace is businesses are doing it all over the place, but the people who would traditionally control IT services into the organisation have no idea that it's actually happening. So the business are saying, I can't get these services from my IT teams, so I'm going to go out into the market and procure them myself. So they're buying cloud-based services from, from parties out there in the ether and the IT teams, in some instances, have no idea those services are being consumed in the business. You're sneaking in under the radar. Is this, good, is this, is this sort of good business for you? You have to end up doing business with different uh, people. For us, per se, particularly, it's not how we potentially operate, of course, we wouldn't say that. But there are, you, know, you look at things like um, you know, sales and marketing budgets being spent on cloud-based sales tools, yeah. and, and IT have no idea that these tools are, are coming in. 
And whilst that's fine from a business perspective, there are some challenges around security It's going to cause problems down the road. Absolutely, it? those it, kind of things. Isn't it? Talking of getting down the road, I just want to refresh people's memory for uh, anyone who didn't either did see our first Regcast and have forgotten it. Uh, it tends to stick in my mind, and um, or people who didn't see it first off. Adrian, you know, this is part of an, a massive project. Give us some idea of the scale of it. Yeah, um, we clearly outsourced in 2003. Uh -huh. So all the stuff. So CFC basically is your IT. Absolutely, department. we've got other partners like BT, etc. But predominantly, probably yeah. CSC is probably 80, 90 percent of it. So, so all the staff, all the assets, all the data centers, all moved over to CSC. So it was a lock, stock, and barrel, huge outsource, about 1.3 billion, big, mm. big thing. Um, and we milked that for five years. You know, we sweated the assets, CSC took the cost down, we took hundreds of millions out of the running cost for raw mail, returned some really good re financial results. 2008 was the watershed where when you don't make investment, if you imagine up to 2003 we'd made little investment because we knew we were outsourcing, mm -hmm. and then you do five years of sweating it. So most infrastructure is seven, ten years old. At that point, severity ones and problems are occurring all over the place. So meantime between failures are, are being destroyed and... So we've got to make this huge investment, and, and the investment was across the board, SAP, desktop, server, the whole lot. Um, you, you could be looking at anything circa a billion pounds worth of IT investment that got to go into the IT world, you know, whether it's in the mail centre automation space or it's actually on you know, the physical desktop. That's the sort of sum total of a sort of budget that we've got to aim at. And I clearly get that, that gets slashed as a headline, but it's still hundreds upon hundreds of millions. Of, of, and, and, and that's government money, it's raw mail money, which is owned by the government currently. So you've got to invest it wisely, you've got to get a return on that investment. So it wasn't just, oh, we've got hundreds of millions to spend, it's wow. When you look at 30,000 desktops, 2,000 sites, you spend a couple of thousand at each site to sort something, suddenly you're at 10, 20, 30 million. So raw mail scope and its size of the organisation is its biggest problem. Mm -hmm. Lots of offices, lots of people, 186,000 people work for raw mail. So now the first time round, we dealt with what you did on the desktop and how you refreshed all of that. And you put the applications into yep. the cloud and the email and that sort of thing uh, into the cloud on that. Um, that went ahead of this. It did, yeah. Of this project, why did you do it in that order? Um, in pure logistics. We've got a retained IT organisation. We were going on, on on the BPOS journey, which was a you know was a risk. We were, again, we were, we were one of the first UK groups to do that of our scale. So we'd got to get an element of confidence of a cloud journey private, public, hosted, doesn't matter, a variant, go with that, get some confidence it's the right thing, partnership with Microsoft as well in there. As soon as that started rolling and we knew it was going to land and we had a high degree of confidence of, yeah, this will land, it was a no-brainer of, right, next evolution. And it's part of a sausage machine. You know, there are, there are several other programs kicking on that will deliver this year, next year, the year after. So there's a big conveyor belt of these and this is the second big one to finish. Two or three more are now in train. Glenn, uh, uh, for their big customers, how typical are they now? Uh, atypical, they're, they're, they're yeah. not, not at all. Mo most of the large customers are are risk averse, um, yeah, and specifically people like public sector. Mm. Um, so public sector want to consume these kinds of services, but but have challenges in doing so. And and in a commercial enterprise, we're seeing it's sometimes a, a bit easier. And one of the things we were talking about just before uh, is around the the procurement blocks sometimes to procuring things in a different mm. way just aren't there, and, and there are certain commercial enterprises who can crack the whip and, and start getting through those, and, and, and some of the public, center, public sector enterprises, they're, they're having challenges in looking at, we want to consume this stuff, let's say, we want to do it against a standard rate card, but we can't actually, we don't have a procurement route to take services yeah. in that way. So there are challenges outside of IT, let's say, that are... That are preventing people from taking advantage of And services. it's also link charged on, I, I noticed we've got a sort of question that's come in already on licensing <coughs> and how that changes when you're sort of private cloud and, yeah. and that sort of thing. This sort of stuff, there is a lot of confusion Definitely. about this at the moment. Yeah. Let's try and sort out some of that confusion. And so first of all, let's look at the decisions that you have to make before you go in there. When you've got this bright idea of let's have a private cloud, first I suppose the question is what do you stick into it? Glenn? So it is, it's, it's like looking at any kind of transformation and, and looking at the workloads that, that sit out there. Um, and then looking at the applicability of those workloads for a, for a cloud environment. And one of the things that we always try and do is look at public cloud first because there, there isn't any argument about the cost balance of public cloud versus private and hybrid and all those other areas. The public cloud is the highest leverage, therefore 
the lowest cost. But there are a lot of workloads that you simply can't put out into the public cloud for, for varying reasons, security, data sovereignty, all of those kind of things. So it's, it's mapping out the workloads that sit inside the business. Mm -hmm. that, that is absolutely the first thing that, that we have to do. So, again, uh, uh, on Royal Mail particularly then, where were the workloads that really, that you looked at them and think, that's really private cloud? The, the, key ones, the key ones are obviously anything that has a regulatory or any kind of security implication. And, and there is a, still a lot of um, fear, uncertainty and doubt around those pieces in that most of the security concerns can, can be answered. And in some cases, we're, we're transforming organizations to the cloud to make them more secure, mm -hmm. more compliant, which is, which is kind of interesting. And that's the it's sort of counterintuitive, isn't it, from it what, is. the, most of what you hear? It is. And, it, and it's back to one of the challenges with a lot of people who've done virtualization. Mm -hmm. They have lots of pockets of virtualization. And actually, it's t challenging to manage. And it's more expensive. And it hasn't delivered what they thought it would deliver because they have uh, multiple environments, multiply managed, and low amounts of governance and actually security. So mm -hmm. transforming those into a public or a private cloud brings actually benefits in governance and security and all of those kind of things that they didn't really have before. Uh -huh. And it's, uh, I'm getting performance benefits, Adrian. Is there anything in particular <coughs> where private cloud trumps virtualization? Um, it, it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a difficult question, really. If I look at our partner, what we wanted is, is all we really wanted was that, you know, when we talk about virtualization versus private cloud, because we'd not done anything up to 2008, when a lot of the world had gone on pure virtualization, mm. we'd kind of missed that, that kind of, that's the missing kind of link for raw mail if we'd not dabbled the feet in there. So to us, it's always been, you guys provide this big super duper resource, we, we, we just dip in there. So we don't talk virtualization and virtualize me this server, virtualize that. We just yeah. say, I've got this big risk in my world of all these old servers. The hardware is eight years old, it's falling over. I can't get, you know, Windows 2000 put on it anymore because of firmware and all those things. And we just go, I don't care, just you guys take that problem away from me on my corporate risk register and, and just deal with it. And, and as long as, uh, you know, when we talk about pr public versus private, f for us it was, uh, yes, Glenn's absolutely right, there are certain things like payroll you would never want to put there for now because we're just risk averse. You could, it would work, chances are you're not going to have a problem, but everybody's a bit nervy, partly because of the hype is hurting you. Mm. But actually for us it was... Uh, We'd got into private cloud because those arguments were going to take too long to get through and the debate, and, and there was never going to be a win in the next three years going around the loops of everybody. Mm -hmm. So you'd never make a move. So at some point you need to break that cycle and say, look, creating a private cloud means it's CSC's problem, our partner, to manage resources in there for a price point for raw mail. Actually, if, if we go fully as much as possible to put into that private cloud, it reduces risks and we get a good price point, as the cloud matures further, you know, pr public and private and hybrid, we can then move things in and out of private cloud when everybody gets a little bit less risk of But at least we've made an inroad. We've made the journey. We've got somewhere. We're getting benefit. There's far too many people, and we, you're right, Tim, you know, when we were at these conferences, you see too many people wanting to join from where they are today to end state. Yeah. And, and everybody's petrified of making that end state move because it's moving so quick. You're never going to get there. Well, yeah, by the time you get there, the end state's moved on. It's somewhere exactly. else so as well. And, and people could be saying, why would you do that? That was ridiculous. That idea was never going to work. Right. Because we're all very wise after the event. Absolutely. Especially me, because I'm a journalist. The, um, the, the, this, uh, the, the sort of decision-making that they're going through, this typifies the fact that there's a, a lot of reg readers a little bit disappointed with what's come out of virtualization. Um, it was their end state that was posited to them little while back? Uh, I, I'm, no, I'm not sure I, I, I'd say that, actually, because a lot of people are quite pleased with what came out of virtualization because there have been some pretty hefty cost savings. Uh -huh. I, I think what they're disappointed by, even if they've got this far, and, and many of them haven't, is um, the, the, this notion of virtualization. Once you've actually gone through a consolidation exercise, that sets you up well to do private cloud. And, and that's the bit, that's where they hit a roadblock because it isn't just an automatic progression because it's a different way of thinking. Interestingly, we, um, uh, I've done a lot of workshops and things around this with people who've been trying to sort of figure out, they've dabbled in this, they've dabbled in that. Um, I've kind of formed the view that if you learn in the public cloud, um, and then tackle private cloud, mm. that's probably the best way around to do it. And I'm not saying, you know, commit, ev commit a lot into the public cloud, but just get a feel Have for... Have a go uh, in the public cloud. Yeah, because there, there you can sort of grab resources and let them go, and, and it's pretty low cost. You can learn, you can get a feel for 
what it's like to work in an environment where you have genuinely decoupled workload from physical resource. Uh -huh. And once you've learned that, then you kind of get yeah. a little bit better what private cloud is about. But I'll add one other thing, which is, um, you know, I hear a lot of people say, well, private cloud is, is great for these elastic um, workloads, you know, things that grow and shrink and, you know, are all very dynamic, et cetera. But actually, when I talk to people who've actually gone down the private cloud route, and it is pretty limited at, at the moment, um, a lot of it boils down to just ease of provisioning, yeah. you know, the flexibility of moving stuff around. It's not highly dynamic, <coughs> real-time stuff at all. It's just taking the, you know, greasing the wheels of just routine day-to-day -day, uh, IT ops. Mm -hmm. so, no, I don't, does that make sense? From yeah, no, that's a, that's that's a great point. Absolutely right, yeah. Dale. It's, it's, if, you, if you took a cradle-to-grave of a server, yeah. And we all know how long it takes for physical provisioning. Yeah. Often when you do traditional virtualization, you, you just basically say, no, I don't have to buy five servers because I've got four virtual servers yeah. headroom. I don't have to spell out POs and things like that for provision of hardware. You're right now. All we're really doing now with private cloud, when you look at it, is you grease and slicken it up so it takes it from several weeks yeah. into several days or several hours or a non-event of, you know, we're paying for that, therefore you recharge. It's far easier to get OPEX into an organization, you know, if these guys want to charge me £2,000 per virtual server per year or whatever, yeah. with a certain CPU box or whatever, or, or, or utility, actually it's far easier to do that on an OPEX cost than writing out a CAPEX case about how it's going to depreciate over a period of time. Yeah. Nightmare. Yeah. And, and then it takes the, you know, back to your point, it takes the decision point away around, in a virtualization world, you, we typically virtualized full workloads. So you virtualized a, a Windows server or a Linux server, mm. uh, and then had an application on top of it, and that was your virtual workload. In a private cloud environment, we, we separate those out into it's an infrastructure, it's a platform play, and then the decisions are made based on the application by application. That's it. And this gets back into what you're saying here, is that not all applications need the same treatment. They Correct. need different... So again, and managing that within a single cloud, is that straightforward? It's not straightforward, but it's critical. Yeah, because if you don't, you end up back in the virtual mess that we see some organisations in, where they're buying tool sets to manage multiple virtual environments, mm. which is kind of crazy in a way. So you build one cloud against those stratas of infrastructure, platform, software, and then business process as a service. And then you can take a workload. So if Adrian says to us, I've got this workload, it does X. We may decide that that's a full package workload that we will run totally on the infrastructure as a service piece, where... It's, it's, it's a full package. It's got the OS, storage, security, and application in one package. Mm. Or we may say, well, that's just a SQL database. Let's leverage it on our SQL service that gives a, let's call it a bronze level of service. So, it, yes, it's disaster recovery, but only in, in the existing environment. We don't do multiple sites. So we can, on workload by workload, we can choose the most appropriate way to deliver the service back in. And the cost associated with that application can, can flex up and down depending on the the credentials it needs to be delivered. Now, you do this sort of thing all day, every day, and so and you're doing it for lots of different customers. But for someone who's building their own private cloud, um, establishing these sort of bronze, silver, gold levels of service, is that something that takes a lot of learning? It, you know, it doesn't. It's relatively straightforward. It, it's down to things like what kind of resilience, what kind of security. Does, does every application in your environment need a platinum approach of... I've just had a new layer, apologies... Another approach. Yeah. Yeah. Does you it can, need you can charge for it? Yeah, that's, <laughs> a good thing. that's it. That's five thousand a year. Stop shouting. Key <laughs> 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 box spot. <laughs> and um, so, when you when you when you're building all of it, when you're making these decisions, how long do you have to give to this process? Is it a process that you can make? Okay. You can decide quite. Can, can I just say one thing? I mean, we've kind yeah. of fallen into trap of, of you know talking about quality of, of service. Mm -hmm. You know, you can engineer a private cloud to. To, to, to be highly resilient, and mm. or you can engineer it just to be low cost if you want to. Yeah, that's true. So, so I, I think it's more a case of um, matching the attributes with whatever environment you're creating. So you know, you, there's no harm in having mm -hmm. multiple private clouds that do different things for different reasons. Okay, right. So let's, uh, let's move this on into you know some of the implementation decisions that you made. Um, one obvious implementation decision that you made is uh, to go Hyper-V, which is the, not the established technology for doing this. So why do you do that? Adrian. Hmm. Um, I, I would say we start to go down this route. Um, 
because we've already got an affinity with Microsoft. So we, we, we'd signed an enterprise agreement already on our desktop world, we were going BPOS. We've got a huge strategic agreement with Microsoft to go down a journey. So for, for us, there was already this huge affinity. Hyper-V had just been launched properly, you know, and hardened up. So Microsoft were very, very, um, very uh, comfortable and would come along with the journey to give us consultancy and make sure this thing was robust. Because actually the, the obvious option was VMware. You know, mm. bang VMware, you never get sacked for doing that. It's rock solid, it's been out there forever. Well, it's mature, you know, it's mature technology and you had yeah. a little bit, there was a little bit less of that risk of the unknown. Absolutely right. So there was part, we'd got this, this huge organisation, Microsoft, saying trust us. The journey's been great so far, which it had, and, and it continues to be. Um, and, and also with the CSC guys, you know, th they got a strong VMware um, organisation within their organisation um, that, that, that worked on NHS and things like that, which yeah. was predominantly built off of VMware. So, so we sat down with the guys in CSE and said, what's your preference? Clearly a lot of the political pressure from CSE was VMware's the choice, that's what we do. Whereas we said, look, you know, we, we want to disrupt things a little bit because we don't necessarily think that's right. We want to go for the right technology. And, and I think what we boiled down to is when we looked at these things and went, VMware for what we're probably going to do is this stepping stone for the next four or five years, because that's what we see it as, as this thing matures, it's probably a Rolls Royce. And actually, you know, raw mail, we need, we've got that ROI we need to invest on. Actually, we're getting a good deal from Microsoft, this whole thing. We just need something good enough. And, and, and that talks to what you said, Dale, mm -hmm. is it would have been so easy to fill a data centre, these, these guys' data centre, full of huge big HP racks of kit and VMware and made it bomb-proof. The reality is, I don't need that. We're delivering letters and parcels in raw mail. I need something that has 99% availability, works virtually all the time, might have an hour out every month, you know, while we're doing maintenance or something, might not. Don't care. Good enough for delivering letters. Actually, and the price point really drove it. Now, that's, yeah, on, on the price, where is the, the cost saving? Is it on licensing or is it on, like you say, the provisioning around it? it it's a little bit of both for us because CSC managed our, our infrastructure, which was predominantly a Microsoft desktop and Microsoft server platform. Mm -hmm. So the tools that we're already using, things like SCCM, etc., we're all intrinsically used by their technicians in India and, and, and across the UK in the leveraged org. So to click in uh, uh, into that tool set, uh, Hyper-V farm was relatively easy because it's intuitively the same tools. So therefore the price point's coming back for these guys as a commodity uh, uh, private cloud for us per, per kind of service was, was relatively cheap. Um, plus you're taking a Windows platform, which all these servers are, and you're moving them to a Windows platform hosted on a Windows kind of kernel. So it was a, the skill set move was, was a de-risk, whereas maybe the VMware one might have been a bit more of a risk for us from where we were moving from. So we kind of said, price is good, saving a bit on licenses, certainly when you compare them to VMware, certainly an, an awful lot cheaper for us. Um, good deal with Microsoft, great deal with CSC. So we kind of ticked it off on price and ticked it off on it, it's worth the journey. Now we started quite small, and we'll come into the implementation in a moment, but mm. we started relatively small with a scale it horizontally so it could horizontally scale and vertically scale but let's start off small so what Dale said about public cr cloud have a try we kind of invented the small private cloud initially mm -hmm. put a dozen servers on it get a feel for it before we went huge yeah. and mm -hmm. expanded it out but we can keep expanding this thing forever and, and is that your advice then if you're implementing sort of to, to private cloud stick a few servers there maybe you know to, small application, something that doesn't really matter if it's uh, not working particularly well in the short term? Certainly for where we were, if, if we look where we were, we've got this huge estate that was, that was creaking. Almost for us it was a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Put double your toe in it because the 2008, 2009, there was no real public cloud to do this. Yeah. Amazon were kind of there, but not really. So therefore we, we've got to do something. So the, the thing for us is do we do virtualization by virtualization, or do we go, let's go on this journey together in partnership small amount of seed investment and go for it together, jointly doing it. And the outcome is if this works, we want a commodity-based private cloud from you where we can just keep throwing more servers into it and more services. But in reality, I, I don't ask these guys to virtualize anymore, virtualize anymore or put anything in the cloud. I just say, move my old estate there. And, and it was all based off of that pilot. The pilot was the thing that gave up my organization further confidence. Yeah, I think yeah. The, the point is that this kind of start small and get some experience is... Um, you know, the concept of a pool is, is, is quite apt because you can sort of pour more water into a pool. Stop with a small pool, like a puddle. pond. Stop yeah, with a puddle. puddle. <laughs> That's it, it's a puddle, isn't it? <laughs> then, yeah, then a pond, then, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And now they've got some sort of bloody great reservoir. But, 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 yeah. uh, and, and I think the whole principle is that it's a, it's a scalable architecture. So in that sense, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You haven't wasted investment. You're not having to scrap what you've done and start again when you want to scale up. 
Um, it, from a practical point of view, actually, we've been doing rounds with some of the um, hardware vendors recently, and it's interesting that a lot of them are now talking about private cloud in Iraq. Yeah. So you can just get going really quickly, and it comes <coughs> with all the config stuff. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that really will help people. Yeah. Are, you, are you packaging, packaging well, up stuff like this? Yeah. Happens. We, we launched this week, in fact, as it were, a, a product called BizCloud, which is exactly mm. that. It's, it's uh -huh. a private cloud off a standard rate card against a set SLA Mm -hmm. um, and it's delivered from, from effectively from point of order into operation in a 10-week period. Uh -huh. It's very aggressive in the marketplace. Uh, and it's, a lot of it's based on the learnings we took from places like Royal Mail. So how do we build a matrix of decision points of this workload does this, this, and this? So what level of service will it require in there? And once you've built up that matrix of workloads, actually provisioning, provisioning a private cloud to deal with it is not that challenging. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the initial assessment piece is, is the most important piece. For and I think that's important because a lot of Reg readers have told us in, in research that um, they, they have struggled with, with trying to build these things manually because it's almost been a kind of kit job and you've yeah. had the best practice hasn't been particularly well defined, the, the, mm -hmm. the ways of doing things. So I think the market's start, starting to mature now with this kind of it approach. So. And what's interesting on the, on the technology decision underlying, um, good enough is good enough, which I think is a great phrase from Adrian, that's absolutely right. Um, but the, the patterns and the methods mm. and the governance piece, which are critical yep. to actually realize the savings on this, don't change over the different technology vendors. Mm. So we, we took our learnings. We had a VMware Center of Excellence inside CSC. We also have a Microsoft Center of Excellence. But the way in which we deliver cloud services against those mm. is it's common, very common. Across across the sort of management base. practice across the two of them is That's fine. fine. So, it, you know, in, in some ways, it doesn't matter where you go as long as you do it the right way yeah. and, you're making, and, and you're making the right decisions. It's still, it's, 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 Mike's not confident here that he's had internal cloud explained to him correctly. So, we do need to clear this one up. So, he's saying, yeah. So, he's saying, is data center connected on an any to any MPLS network? Is that. Yeah. Is that private uh, cloud? That's what we have. That's what you have. That's Into our exactly. partners, CSC and, and Microsoft, we have MPLS links to any to any between CSC and Microsoft to deliver BPOS or this cloud service that these guys provide for us. So diverse routing all over the place, Secure Plus. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. I, it, confusion gets in the way of people making decisions, doesn't it? It is. Well, what we're seeing in the market right now is, is the actual word cloud is becoming, it's becoming a bit of a dirty word. People are sick of hearing the word cloud. We'll deliver yeah. that by cloud. Mm. And what's interesting is when, when we talk to the business around the services they want to consume, it, it's almost a, it, it's a given that our first port of call will be some kind of as-a-service provision, be it platform or infrastructure or software. Mm. And it's not the question that we have to go out and talk to anymore. It's... What are you trying to do? What, what are you trying to achieve? What are the workloads that will allow you to achieve that? And what's the business process underlying it? Then we'll look at how we provision a service in, and cloud doesn't get mentioned as much. There's an interesting point, and it's kind of in the learnings, um, Tim, when we were going through the, the, the pilot proof of concept, and we made a few hiccups in the early days when we started off small, where people like myself and, and, and some of my colleagues inside Royal Mail would, would sit with the techies and people like Glenn and go, well, let's look at this box that we're going to move it, move over here, and let's look at the CPU, and let's look at the memory, and let us make sure in Royal Mail that, that that's, that's a good candidate for, for moving into this space. And, and actually, we, we made a bit of a faux pas for the first three or four months. It, you know, we almost had to backtrack and start again, um, because actually, you know, what we'd got wrong, and it kind of is related to the cloud sort of mindset of, what, why are we dictating as a, as, a, as a client, the end recipient wanting a service, whether it will fit on this thing. Because actually, if, if you look at it from a contract point of view, I don't want any culpability of that, and that's why I outsource. So you guys, build me this reservoir pond, don't care how big, as long as it can flood up to the right size. And, and the way we got our program back on track from the first hiccup in the first three months was move the raw male people's heads, people like my head and other people's heads, out of the space of worrying about you know, bandwidth throughput, memory taking over, you know, how many threads and, and, and all that techie geeky stuff. Not our concern. Ours is we've got a really important mail application that sorts mail around the country. Um, it's on creaky hardware. Please solve it on the farm. So but for us, cloud abstracted for us to say, you deal with that, and you get on with it, geeky guys, and decide what you're going to mesh together. We don't care. Yeah, live long and prosper. Yeah, yeah, I'm no, not going to do the signal. I'm <laughs> yeah, <just making> <laughs> but the, you know, but then, then you are in a fortunate position of having given 
this problem to someone else a few right. years back. Now, for some of the guys, and also there seems to be, a, there's a question here about how this relates to small organizations yep. as well. Because if you're doing that yourself, does this mean there has to be an abstraction between two voices within the IT department where one gets on with that sort of stuff and the other one has to learn a way of just doing the business talk about this is what we want? Before going on, though, can we, it might be worth just sort of taking a step back and saying, well, what, what is it that makes a, you know, what are the technology components of a private cloud? Because I think that... that Maybe we haven't touched I on know, that. It's but, a, yeah, um, if we haven't, yeah. What, I mean, what are they? Well, well bas basically, um, I mean, there's, there's two main things in my mind. One of them is, is you, you've got a bunch of resource there, mm -hmm. and you want your workloads to, to be able to move freely across those. Yep. What does that boil down to? It boils down to fancy provisioning in, in a nutshell. Yep. Now, you can dress that up as much as you like. You can call it what you want. You can, um, you can automate it. You can semi-automate it so it's kind of assisted. You know, you want to move move stuff around, you want to allocate more resource to a workload. Um, uh, th th there are systems that will actually do that for you on the fly. You know, Azure works on that kind of basis, for instance. Um, but a lot of the time, you're, you're going to want to just have uh, some recommendations coming back fr from the private. It knows what it's up to. It gives you some guidance on what it thinks should be done based on what you've said you want to do. And then you, but you're in control of, of whether you allocate more more servers to, to this particular workload, or you, you put more workloads on this server, whatever. What it's doing is just greasing the wheels of provisioning, really. It's, it's not magic, it's not rocket science. But there are some additions around, certainly in the larger enterprises, around the billing aspect and, and being granular about that billing. So, being effectively for, the organi so for small organizations that, that don't outsource, um, that ability to almost become the outsourcing partner to their businesses and provide it on a as a service to their business. So instead of saying, yes, to do that, we need a Windows box and SQL Server and XXX, it's the cost of the service to your business unit will be £3 per user per month. Yeah, we'll I mean, take care of what that, that piece is. So as soon as you say that, Glenn, there's a whole bunch of guys out there listening whose hackles will go up because yeah. you know, the last thing they want is charge back accounting with the business. No, I understand um, that. But, but the, the, the point is that the private, the private cloud environment, whatever you want to call it, um, you can track usage, you can monitor the, the thing as a, as a whole, wow. and that's the basis for chargeback billing if you want to go down that route. Sure. But it also just gives you much more visibility and control over how you're using your resources. That's and I think that, that's important from an ops point of view. Yeah, from the, from the operational point yeah, of view, yeah. that's, you, you think that's the, the yeah, magic Yeah, you're thing. getting rid of some fragmentation. You've, you've got flexibility without fragmentation, I think, is one, one way of looking at it. And one of the other benefits on the private side versus public, and I know it's one of the questions, is that that reuse of that leverage of existing licensing. So when it's in a private environment, you already own the licensing, you can leverage that licensing whichever way you choose. As soon as you decide to move that to a public environment, you have to look at if it's a bespoke service, how do you innovate those licenses, et cetera, or do you just consume a brand new license from a new cloud There is provider? a lot of confusion about this at Definitely. the moment, isn't there? And I think some of that comes back from the the software vendors haven't quite yep. moved their licensing oh, on as, as they should have done. Agreed. You say in private cloud, this as long as the licenses stay in private complex. cloud, it's, it's a, a lot, lot less, less complex. complex. It's a lot less complex, but there are some things you need to be aware of because you know there are people sitting there on licenses that are tied to physical Correct. attributes of a machine. Absolutely. Right. And when as soon as you start, as soon as you start to put it on a virtual environment, they can flex. You know, per core of licensing, sort of goes out. It does. Agree. That, that was one of the reasons why Hyper-V looked so attractive to us, and it was one of the yeah. decision points. If, uh, Microsoft had launched under Hyper-V the data center license, which meant, in effect, we could, lo we could put any type of number of hosts, i.e. Uh, Windows 2008, 2003 server box, on that farm forever because we were licensed on the physical um, large host machine as opposed to the guest machine that's actually yeah. running it. Yeah. So we can just keep pushing server boxes and SQL and everything in with no impact, no yeah. 3,000 quid for a license here and that. That's going to be a bit of a shock, isn't it, once you've done your cost and you suddenly get this, you know, you suddenly so realise that time. you passed your licences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and, and you, need, you can't generalise on this because you can have exactly the same product. You, know, you take a database management system, you talk to some people, they've licensed it on one basis, another, another site they've licensed it on another basis, and actually within the same organisation they're sitting on multiple variants of, of that database licence. So, unfortunately, there's no shortcut to that. You've got to work through it. Adrian, I've got someone in here saying that you shouldn't be slouching. You've got to sit up. You shouldn't be slouching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all it's, 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 it's your mum. He says it's not good for your back. 
<laughs> yeah. from the back. Yeah, it's not good. It's not well, good. Clint's got to give me a massage later. It's part of the plan. <laughs> so. Just not go there. I, I, I don't. <laughs> honestly, I, I don't really want to know. That's it. Scully. <laughs> Now it's um, again when you know looking back to last week when I was you know, when it was the cloud show and there was a lot of um, there were some people that we were talking to who were saying they were very keen on this it became it was a hard sell internally to the management in terms of what they would be getting back for what they're investing and so the, you know first one for you Adrian you you basically made all the decisions on this didn't yeah, yeah. you people gave you yeah. If you had um, management that was sceptical about private cloud, yeah. what would you be saying to them? Whew. Well, that's a nice question. Thanks for yeah, yeah, well, for telling me off the slouch. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it, it's kind of a difficult one, isn't it? Because it was yeah. easy for Royal Mail because we've got a phenomenal risk register item corporately of there are hundreds of servers going end of well, gone end of life, and yeah. anyone pops, we're in trouble. That doesn't take any board in the world has to sign that off and say, so what are you going to do about it? So my business case was easy. It was, we invest in tin and traditional, a gazillion pounds over here, or we do half of a gazillion to do something innovative. Now, in, the innovation brings risk, because I think, I think we all realise one of the problems of virtualization, the, the forerunner to this, has been, well, you put all your eggs in one basket. All oh, right, well, at the moment, if they're all on physical tin, when that piece of tin pops... You lose one service. Oh, when virtualization pops, you lose everything. All the eggs are there. So you get cost, but you get that. So, so I would say it all depends on each company. I think the big sell I do is, is be honest. Because what we know with, with our finance colleagues in all our organizations and our risk communities, as soon as you try and elongate and sell, you know, sell the, oversell the benefits of this, which IT are notorious for doing, as soon as you start to impact that case where people start to smell a rat, that you maybe just you know, jazz handed around some of the benefits, mm -hmm. your case falls apart quite quickly because of the volume of things you're going to chuck into these clouds. You know, if you're overstating the benefit of a service by £500 and you're putting 500 servers in, suddenly that business case can come unstuck overnight like that. Mm. But, but the important thing is, as you move your first ones in, I would certainly break any business case into phases. Pilot phase, get confidence, get your stakeholders on board, make sure you do deliver your benefits. And then all the way through, just making sure your finance and risk communities through multiple phases, 50 servers, 50 services, whatever, you, whatever you're going to move into that cloud, you tick them off and get the benefits realised. Because then you can get, go for another piece of funding. So I wouldn't ever go in and say, I want £20 million to go and do this journey. I'd say the end scope over the next three years might be £20 million worth of investment, but I'm going to save £10 million over a traditional way of doing it, and I'm going to break it into call-off chunks where we'll, we'll jointly decide, especially with the industry moving so quickly. You know, it, it will be a radically different place in five years to where it is now. So I think it gives you these little breaks rather than a unveil a ta-da, here's end state. Yeah. Because end state will get you fired because you'll go down the wrong route <laughs> or you'll have to jump your no, first I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think a lot of people, there's going to be some kind of trigger point for, for, for this, and, and we, we know from... from um, uh, some of the surveys we've done, that people are sitting out there. I mean, you're ahead of the curve now, quite, yeah. quite seriously, compared to a lot of people out there who are sitting on eight, nine, yeah. even older year, year old servers. And, you know, these things have to be replaced at some point. Everyone knows it. Uh, as soon as you get to a point where you have to make a, a, a critical decision, then um, it's a question of look, looking at this in context. But from a business case point of view, it's a bit like... Um, uh, I was late for a meeting yesterday, and do I spend eight quid on a taxi to get to the meeting on time? Well, actually, it wasn't about whether I spend eight quid on a taxi. It was whether I spend eight quid on a taxi or five quid on a on a tube ticket. And so it was really three quid I was talking about. Yep. Uh, and I think that that is the delta to focus on because you're going to have to upgrade your infrastructure anyway. A lot of people so listen to this. So what you're upgrading it to? You you may as well pay a little bit more, put a little bit more investment in in skills, resource, and bit, maybe a little bit of investment in tools and that kind of thing, to to, to be future proof really. How much help do you give on the decision making? How definite can you be around numbers now? So a lot a lot more, uh, and from the learnings we've had at places like Royal Mail and, and many other companies now, where we're deploying public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud environments, we can be a lot more precise. I mean, we talked about this this biz cloud service that we've just launched. We we give a standard rate card. So you pay what's on you know, what's on the standard rate card on a per user or per CPU or per mm -hmm. per gigabyte charge. So it's almost like taking the Amazon type service yep. and making it into a private cloud. And we, we stand by that rate card full stop. 
Yeah. And, and those oh, kind yeah, of learning Someone will sort of stick it on their credit card in the first place yeah. before well, they get I think you raise an am uh, uh, I know it's a, uh, amusing but a really interesting point. Yeah, I was in a meeting yesterday with a, with a public sector client of ours who, who have written the business case, and, it's, and it's, yes, it's signed off. Procurement can't procure the service because they don't have a structure that allows them to procure this as an OPEX They're, they're a badly service. named department in that case, aren't they, it's really? really Non-procurement department. It's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're seeing this as the, the, you know, the changing of the way that the IT business you know, talk to the business. Mm. So there's a lot of business owners who are emotional about, I want a rack of kit, and I want to see it, and I want to feel it, and I want to touch it. And IT is saying, yes, sign this purchase order, you can have one. And we, we joked before about people launching um, small business racks in a box with ornate wooden carvings that match the Chesterfield sofa in the corner mm -hmm. in jest, but people do like to fe feel it and touch it. And if we can flip the minds of certainly the, uh, the business to you don't need to feel or touch it anymore, we'll provide you with that service, those decisions will be a lot easier out in the business. You'll get less pushback from the business owners who don't need to. So, so there's a political you know. dimension to that. I, I actually think, there's, well, not think, uh, we, we know that there is um, some things that will trip you up just on basic budgeting and accounting. We, when you look at how people budget for IT expenditure and you look at how they account for yes. it, you know, the depreciation of, of yep. capital expenditure is a pretty normal way against yep. a cost centre. Mm. Well, as soon as you've got a pool now, it doesn't live, you know, you can't allocate it to I a cost centre the same way. Um, our CEO, Mo Moy Green, uh, um, who came in last year, um, talks about actually using partners as true partners rather than suppliers. So using the power of you know, technology organisations, balance sheets and P&Ls to help your organisation in a partnership. So rather than Royal Mail spending £100 million buying a load of tin for a data centre, uh, we can get somebody like CSC to spend £10 million now rather than actually thinking oh, I've, got to, I've got to depreciate over 10, 20 years or 10 years. Actually, these guys can buy just enough just enough with enough headroom, what they're forecasting, but have a slick provisioning process to slick them in at any point. Whereas with raw mail, we would have to go out and potentially, because we're not an IT organisation, procure for two years because of the whole procurement problem. And mm -hmm. so, so actually, you know, we're using the power of these people and other partners in that innovative way now where you're bleeding across organisations, mm -hmm. actually helping with the cash engineering of budgets. And there, are, there are partners in the small business space who are doing exactly the same as something like CSC is doing in the, in the larger corporate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, the, but there is the, now when we're looking at the lessons learned here, let's look at that for the last 10 minutes, but the first one that you pointed out here, Glenn, is that you can't just turn up with a credit card and end up with a private cloud. Strangely, unfortunately not, no. Certainly in, in, the, in the realms of people dipping their toe in the water yes. and those kind of things, Get your credit card out, get to Amazon, spend your two pounds a month or whatever it is to, to buy some services uh, and, and try it out. But, but in terms then of the private, start doing the serious thinking that's based exactly on what right. you've learned from yes. that. Yeah, you can't rock up with a credit card. Well, so beginning to end, well, beginning to production system, what sort of time? Well, Royal Mail was a bit, was a bit longer, but taking the lessons learned, as I say, you know, this 10 week period that we're You can do 10 weeks, to, you we reckon? Do 10 now. weeks now, yes, because it's. It's, it's a pretty slick, well-known, understood process. How much of that 10 weeks is engineering and how much is working out what you need to engineer? So most, it's, they're all run in parallel, effectively. So yeah, I, I, I yeah. The initial work, most of the consulting activity around looking at workloads obviously kicked off day one. Yeah. Most of the engineering is pre-built. It's pre-built, blueprinted, already um, standard methodology, standard patterns. So you can put in if necessary, racks of servers, which are all standard with a, with a fabric across the piece, which is really important. So workloads can flow across the piece. Mm -hmm. And then the next iteration of that, so driving into the, the uh, hybrid cloud with, with companies like um, Azure with, from Microsoft, where that fabric will stretch from the public into the private cloud, and you can start stretching workloads out mm -hmm. to the public cloud on, on the same fabric under the same control, same management techniques and methods and patterns and those kind of things. You, you see, it's, it's I, getting I, more and more simplistic. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't wish to sort of cut across you on that, but I will. <laughs> you um, will? Yeah. Because I think it's easy to say that you've got a private cloud, now you can overspill or, or, or extend out into the public cloud. But actually, as soon as you do that, you've got a whole can of worms in terms of you've compliance, compliance security, problems. That's absolutely. what you've got to be question it, about that it, one, it, yeah. It, exactly. What's this go to PCI DSS compliance? Yeah. So, so technically it can be done, but, but I think you know, it, it, it brings with it just a, a whole set it of... It does, things. and it's back to yeah. assessing those workloads, not based on how much CPU and RAM, what are the ramifications of sitting data 
in a, in a different location. So, so there's a so technique I use. Uh, we, I should have put it on a chart, actually. But um, You should have done for this, uh, uh, <laughs> Get ready for next time. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I get people to imagine a, um, two, two dimensions. Well, yeah. One of them, the question is, should, should a workload live on existing sort of fixed infrastructure, or should you move it into some kind of dynamic private cloud type infrastructure? So that's one dimension. The other dimension is, should it live on your premises, in your own data center, or can it live in a hosted environment? And you can actually plot that as a quadrant, which is quite interesting. Yeah. So top right is where you've got all the flexible hosted stuff. Bottom left is traditional IT. And, and I do this in workshops all the time. I just get people to say, OK, wh where over the next year, you know, if you could wave a magic wand, where would you have stuff running? And there's a whole bunch of stuff that would still live in the bottom left because there's no reason to move it. But actually, just, as soon as you start thinking about it that way, there's some things that quite naturally move up into the top left but they won't move into the, the right which is going off site because of compliance reasons or whatever. Yes, right. But then there's a whole bunch of other stuff that maybe isn't that critical, it's not compliance related, that you can move across onto the right hand side. So you, you just have to be able to make a list of what those things are. And you, just you, think it through. Yes. What, you've, what you said here is that you, know, you, you can't burst into the cloud payroll would be one. Others that you can't do that with? Well, it, it's about capacity planning and, and capacity planning in your cloud. Don't, don't capacity plan for things that the market is touting is burst. So payroll runs once a month. That's a bursting tool. That's not. That's mission that's not critical. You, you don't pay people. They're not going to turn up for work on Monday. So I wouldn't be looking at bursting that. I'd be you've bad, got to build that into capacity. what you've got. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there are others. So anything that happens on a regular basis that is critical to the business operation. Yes, technically, as Dale says, we could move that wherever we want. But in reality, we'd build for that entire capacity because you, you can't have that service not. So, and but, but the kind of things that you you might want to burst are things like website apps, where yeah, yep. you, you know a campaign Absolutely. just leads to your, your website <coughs> being maxed out. Mm -hmm. Now on the uh, on the SLAs and the availability and that sort of thing, a lot of people have done virtualization. I've been thinking about that already. Does private cloud thinking move that on? I think it does. Uh, and in terms of and again from from our experience, what we do, we're able to to set out different types of, of SLA against different types of application criteria. So an application may need to be available 24 by 7 with multi-site disaster recovery. And another application may be a let's do an eight hour recovery on that. It's not critical to the business and we can afford for it down to be for it to be down for eight hours. They still sit in the same cloud, they just have different characteristics yeah. of the application. Small fodder applications, you know, your low end stuff that you it's just fodder for clouds. Yeah actually benefit from it and, it and it's certainly some of our learnings of we'd have applications hundreds of them that would have a 95 percent availability you know because they're on windows 2000 and are 10 years old inherently moving them into private cloud you, you get that minimum that, yeah. that the whole cloud would have to fall over to actually breach anywhere yeah. near it so you bring every application up to the minimum level for zero mm. cost or yeah. in fact quite the reverse for a cheaper cost base right. so so it's all the really legacy applications really benefit from it Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's important in your business case you list that. Now, whether your business needs that or not, if you're getting it cheaper and they get an increase in uh, availability, then hey. You know. Yeah, so I, I do think that, so that's one dimension of, of SLAs. The, I mean, the, the other dimension of, of service provided is how quickly you can respond to any requirement. And, and, you know, just greasing the wheels of provisioning, as we said, means that yeah. you can move that much more. Upgrades. Do you, want, do, you want, do you want to catch this one, Glenn, that you're looking at now, about, sort of, yeah, about how um, you map particular applications to the hardware, the underlying infrastructure, because that's important for guaranteeing SLAs and change management. And in certain circumstances it, it, it is, and in others it, it isn't, as Adrian said, in that you want to put them out into the cloud infrastructure and let it manage where it sits. There aren't a huge amount of applications that you need to tie to absolutely physical environments. But what's critical to this is having that knowledge management, that, that information database, that's live. So running CMDBs on Excel spreadsheets, you, you can't do that anymore. They have to be live dynamic systems. And the tool sets that we use to manage these cloud environments keep live dynamic CMDB. So if you need to stipulate that this service has to live in one physical location and be disaster recovery, if you like, into another, that's part of the decision set. So when the, the cloud tools are saying it would be beneficial to move this, oh, hang on, a rule here says I, I can't do that because that would have both of my DR environments on the same physical mm. piece of hardware. And you can build those rules into the actual management tools and move it away from being a pure technology decision into a business decision of actually, yes, technically, logically, right thing to do to move these workloads here, but in reality, the rules saying I shouldn't be able to, I shouldn't do that, so the system won't do that. 
-hmm. Now, your final point here is that uh, virtualization has created an ex uh, expensive mess. See, so Glenn agrees with me, actually, Dale, even though, you know, <laughs> you know, you don't, I know you guys, I'm, I'm only joking. The, uh, but it's, uh, do you think that there is a potential for um, private cloud just to make a mess on top of a mess? Personally, I do, yes, which yeah. is why you know, one of the points that we made earlier on was you build one private cloud. Uh -huh. And yes, there's multiple dimensions to it, but it's one private cloud managed in one way, provisioned in the same way, billed in the same way, rather mm. than and what we've seen in virtualization. And there are people who've done it well, don't get me wrong. There are lots of people who've done yeah. it well and got cost savings. But there are also lots of people who have built it in pockets on pockets departmentally. And, and actually, when you roll up the entire cost, it's more expensive to manage. So they may have made some small departmental cost savings, but overall it's costing the business more to manage. Yeah. It's what's happened after the initial consolidation project yes. that um, is the problem. So, so it, it, it's at its best the day you do the consolidation. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and after it, that, it gradually trickles away. Yeah. And we, we've had, what was it you, you call my, my mate Tony, Dr. Stats, uh, Dr. on Stats. here talking about um, virtual server sprawl and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it, it is a real problem that Regvita has talked talk to us about. Yeah. I mean, bit, so, so you don't need to fill in purchase, and a lot of people control um, their CMDB almost by purchase order. And if you're saying you don't need a purchase order anymore, you've got to report it and say, mm -hmm. I need this workload here, here, and here, and hit click. That's, that's a step that most organizations use for governance. And if you're missing that step out now, you need to look at a different so way of governing really that really simple platform. things like, you know, how many unpatched virtual uh, machines do you have sitting out there that haven't been spun up for six months? Yeah. Well, what happens when you do spin them up? Immediately yeah. you've got a vulnerability. It's, it's yeah. basic stuff like that. It is. Yeah. Adrian, if there, to finish us off here, if there's one thing that people have to avoid to make sure that you know, they don't make a big mistake doing this, what would that be? I'll do a couple. One is don't micromanage your partner if you're using them. If, you, if you're in the fortunate position of raw mail, and a lot of big corporates will be, yeah. then let these guys make the decisions because these guys then make the failures and you can have one throat to check. Successes, I think you'll find it. Oh, clearly it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm in charge of the enterprise stock, be quiet. Um, so um, you know, do that, and uh, back in your place, God damn you. Um, so what I would say is uh, do that. And the other one is that, that, that we've not teased out is, and Glenn talked about CMDB, it forces the, your organisation to understand your application. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about, you know, we hear it constantly with cloud of, oh, uh, PCI compliance, regulatory, offshore data, Patriot attack. You could write them now for any, anything yeah. we'll do. The, the reality is it forces you application by application and service by service for, the, for my organization to really question that application. And actually, it allows us to put it in. We, under our program, we had these buckets of applications and servers we, we were classifying things in. The benefit to us now is when Hyper-V and the cloud, private cloud and public cloud, actually start to converge into more of a hybrid, when Microsoft releases that product, or, or Amazon or any of the other big providers allow us to move from private to public and get extra cost benefit, we'll be able to move quite quick because the application has already been classified yep. in and we can move you quickly. Now that's when we'll get even greater benefits because we're not going to spend three months debating an application. We can just go, it's already classified, move. We all agreed it. So there's that watershed moment that you've got to do and it's not really with your provider, it's, it's internally and that's quite hard getting everybody internally between security, legal, the group that actually runs the application and uses it and IT to agree on anything, let alone the classification of data. Okay, time's up, guys. That's it. That's the end. So, uh, so uh, let's hope you can boldly go where these guys have already gone. <laughs> and uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening. If you are uh, if you're watching live, if you're part of our live audience, then in an hour's time we've got even more Regcast coming up for you. Office three six five came out of beta yesterday. We've, got, uh, we've already got some people who've been doing the dirty work on it to see exactly what works and what doesn't. So, uh, Office 365, are you going to be using that? No, we've done beta on it. We're Don't on BPOS, so yeah. we're, we're looking it's at a bridge, a, for you. a bridge with Microsoft between BPOS D and maybe Office 365 in a year. Yeah. And cost uh, so, yeah I, I'm running over. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for, thanks for all your help. Thanks for coming back in again. And, Dale, thanks as ever. I'm going to be seeing you, you a little bit later, aren't I? Yeah. For Office 365, it's a big day for you today. Mm. And uh, thank you, audience, and uh, thanks for all your questions. Let us know what you think. Download the applications, give us some feedback. We do more of what you like, less of what you don't like at the Reg. So we'll see you later. I've been Tim Phillips. Goodbye. <laughs>